while back I made this shoe cabinet and hat and coat rack using some birch plywood for our newly renovated entrance hall in our bungalow. I have a video about that project and I also have a video about the renovation which is available as a Patreon or YouTube membership exclusive video. Links to both of those in the description box below. Anyway, since then we've not really added anything else to the room as we've not really decided what we want to put in there yet so it was just looking a bit empty and I ended up finding this nice artificial plant which I thought would look nice in the corner and add a bit of colour. There's not much natural light in this space so a real plant probably wouldn't survive here. Anyway, that plant needed a plant stand and that seemed like a good project to use up some of the smaller offcuts of 18mm birch ply left over from the previous project so that's what I'm going to make in this video. First I designed what I wanted to make in SketchUp and this is what I came up with. It has eight segments, so it's octagonal, and I designed the size so that the plant pot that came with the plant should drop in and fit nicely. Plans and cut lists for making this style of pot in various sizes will be available via my Etsy page, so if you want to make one of these for a specific sized plant pot, you should find what you need in my plans. You can also get free access to not only these plans, but all of my project plans and cut lists via Patreon or YouTube channel membership. The first job was to rip the plywood down to what will be the height of the pot at the table saw. I then need to tilt my table saw blade so I can get the zero clearance insert plate removed and the original insert plate installed. That has a wider slot so that will allow the blade to tilt over. I'm going to make the cut in a way so that I can have continuous wood grain pattern around the pot. I'll show you what I mean by that later in the video and that's just personal preference. I just think it'll look nicer but it'd be much easier to cut the segments for the pot without worrying about keeping a continuous grain pattern. But it's just something I wanted to try for this project. I tilt the table saw blade to a 22.5 degree angle and 22.5 off 90 degrees is 67.5. So that's the angle I need on the table saw blade and I can dial it in perfectly using my digital angle gauge. And I'm going to make the cuts with the mitre gauge that came with my table saw. First I just need to check that it's set to 90 degrees to the blade using my framing square. And I'm making sure that the framing square isn't touching any of the teeth on the blade which could throw the angle off slightly. If you've seen my previous table saw review video, you'll know that this mitre gauge doesn't fit the mitre slots on the saw as well as I'd hoped. But I'm going to go ahead and use it anyway. A homemade table saw sled would probably give better results but I haven't made one for this saw yet so I'm just going to use what I have. The first cut I want to make is to establish the 22.5 degree angle on the end of the workpiece so that's what I'm doing here. I then measure and mark the width that each segment will need to be and I can then flip the mitre gauge over to the other side of the saw and carefully position it so that the pencil mark lines up with the blade. I then added some masking tape to the table and made a pencil line to mark the position of the workpiece before making the cut to enable me to cut more pieces to the same size in a repeatable way. Something that didn't occur to me at the time was that instead of using this masking tape and a pencil mark, I could have simply set up a temporary fence to reference the workpiece from each time before making the next cut. To do that I would have needed to make sure that the fence stops in advance of the blade to avoid the risk of the workpiece kicking back, which would not be safe. An easy way to do that would be to add a sacrificial block to the fence to reference from. Whether using a fence would have given me more accurate results or not is difficult to say. That method could be more accurate, but it could also be less accurate due to accumulative errors depending on how accurately the fence would be set in position in the first place. If I was making this pot as a commission for someone else, or if I was making them to sell, then I would want the angles to be perfect with no gaps, and to do that I'd cut some test pieces using some scrap plywood to get the fence dialed in and get things as perfectly accurate as I could. But as this is for my house, I'm not worried about it being absolutely perfect, and I'd also rather not waste wood cutting samples first, so I just went for it first time. So here with the workpiece positioned up to the mark on the masking tape, I'm cutting the first segment to size and this cut didn't go well because the workpiece was snagging on the crown guard. I should have raised the height of the blade before making the cut. I'm still getting used to this new saw so that's my excuse. Later on I'll show you the problem that occurred from making this cut and the blade deflecting slightly and I'll show how I resolve that too. With the first piece cut I then flip the mitre gauge over to the other slot again and carefully line up the blade with the edge of the workpiece so that I can remove a triangular segment. 
And you'll see that I'm creeping up on this cut because I want to remove as little of that face veneer as possible so the grain on this segment lines up with the next segment when the pot gets assembled. Then I flip the mitre gauge over again, lining the end up with my pencil mark again, and from here on it's just a case of repeating the same process again and again to cut each segment. When I got to cutting the final segment, I realized it would have been much more comfortable making this cut if I'd started with a longer workpiece so that there would be more of it referencing against the mitre gauge. Also, my hands are closer to the blade than I'm really comfortable with, but I just took the cut slowly and carefully. I also had to remove the crown guard for this cut because it would have gotten in the way. So I definitely recommend starting with a longer workpiece than I did if you're going to make one of these, and I'll include some recommended dimensions for a starting workpiece in the project plans. Okay, so that went reasonably well. You can see here I've got a nice continuous grain and the gaps between boards are nice and tight all of the way up. Apart from the very first one that I cut, which you can see here has a slight gap in the middle. So I'm gonna have a go at just trying to take off a little piece from this end using a block plane. So this problem was as a result of the blade deflecting when the mitre gauge was hitting into the crown guard, as I mentioned earlier, and you can see a close up of the problem here. But it was easy enough to true up the edge using a few swipes with the block plane. And then the two pieces met together really nicely. Here I'm lining up the pieces all flush and hopefully in this shot you can see what I meant by that continuous grain pattern from left to right. I added some masking tape to join each segment to the next. I can then flip it over and add wood glue. And then I can fold the octagon shape together with the masking tape acting as kind of a hinge. Then to pull the shape together nice and tight, I added some elastic bands around it and I can then just leave it to dry. I left it overnight and the next day I can remove the bands and tape and find out how it all went. So it's all glued up now and I noticed when I was gluing it up that the last piece didn't want to join together so well. So you can see here that there's a little bit of a gap. But there wasn't really much I could do about that. It's not like you can apply clamps to a glue up like this because obviously you need the pressure to come from each and every angle in order to sort of pull all of these joints together. It still feels nice and solid though, but I am going to squeeze in some polyurethane glue into these gaps and that glue expands, so it's a good gap filling glue. That will sort the strength issue and I'm not too worried about the aesthetics of the gap because that panel is going to be at the back anyway because I want to see this continuous grain. And also once I sand these and burnish the edges, which I'll show later on, I think it's going to hide that gap anyway. I added some masking tape here just to keep clean up of the glue to a minimum and then sprayed on a little water which helps to activate the polyurethane glue and I squeezed some into the gap. This stuff dries quite quickly and it foams up to fill any gaps. So here I'm just getting rid of the excess with a chisel. Next I'm going to work on making the legs and I had a small piece of 24 mm thick birch ply that I could use for this. 18 mm would have been fine for this too, but again, I'm trying to use up some small off cuts here, but also thicker legs will be a nice feature, I think. I make a rip cut to establish what will be the height of the legs. And then I lower the blade to set it to cut about halfway through the 24 mm thickness. And here I'm cutting what I guess is a rebate joint and it'll become clearer later on how this will work. I made multiple rip cuts at the table saw, moving the fence in between cuts to remove most of the waste. And then I can get rid of the rest and chisel everything nice and smooth.
Initially, this is the shape that I came up with for the legs and I didn't really like it and also I didn't really feel that it would complement the shoe cabinet very well. So I ended up drawing up a more square version and I liked that better, so that's what I went with. I'm going to cut the legs at the mitre saw and here I'm marking them up. And then I can figure out what angle these cuts need to be made at. So I'm just adjusting the angle and lining it up with my pencil marks and it ended up being four degrees. So I've marked up my legs here and what I should have done is left a three millimeter space in between each leg to account for the curve of the mitre saw blade. But instead what I'm going to do is cut on the right hand side of this line and then the left hand side of this line and do that all of the way along. It'll leave me with slightly thinner legs than those that I've marked out but that doesn't really matter. I thought about making these cuts at the bandsaw, but the mitre saw is going to give me much cleaner cuts, so there'll be less clean up work, which is always nice. Next I wanted to add a bottom panel to the pot, so here I'm routing out a rebate around the inside perimeter using a bearing guided rebate bit. And I'm taking shallow passes, lowering the bit by a few millimetres at a time in between passes until the rebate is deep enough. I'm going to use some of this 9mm ply that came from a packaging crate to make a bottom panel. I didn't want to waste birch ply on this as no one will see it when the plant is in it. I mark around the inside and then cut out the shape at the bandsaw. And I needed to round over the corners slightly to get this to fit because the router bit obviously leaves rounded corners. And then I can glue it in place and this bottom panel is going to add much more strength to the pot as glued mitered plywood edge grain joints on their own aren't going to be particularly strong. I mean they'll probably hold up just fine unless you literally throw the pot on the floor or something. But the point I'm trying to make is that that bottom panel just reinforces everything. I added my maker's mark to the bottom once the glue was dry. And then before sanding I spent some time working on the edges with a burnisher. This just helps to break over the fibres of the wood very slightly and it rounds them over and it'll help to hide any tiny gaps. If you don't have a burnisher you could easily just use a screwdriver handle or something like that. I can then sand everything at 120 grit. That's all it really needed as the birch ply was already pretty smooth. And then I can install the legs and these just got glued and clamped onto the sides and I just centered them by eye. Finally, I finished the pot using water-based varnish. This is the same finish as I used on the shoe cabinet and I chose it because it doesn't amber or yellow the plywood. Water-based finishes will keep the wood nice and pale and preserve the original color pretty closely. In between coats of varnish I denibbed with 400 grit wet and dry paper and I gave it three coats of varnish in total and then it was looking pretty nice. So I could take it into the house and try it out for size and luckily it fitted in there really nicely. This project was pretty quick to do, I think it took about four to five hours in total and I'm really happy with how it turned out. And like I said earlier, if I was making these to sell I'd spend a lot more time trying to get the joints as accurate and tight as possible, but sometimes good enough is good enough. I know some people aren't into the whole exposed plywood edge grain thing, but we really like it and it's something that we're planning to do in our bathroom too, which we're currently in the process of renovating, so stay tuned for more projects in future. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please subscribe if you haven't already for more weekly woodworking videos. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can via PayPal for a one-off donation, or if you'd like to get early access to my videos, some exclusive content, including the entrance hall renovation video I mentioned earlier, and a house tour video among others, plus free project plans and a name credit at the end of my videos, then you can support the channel via Patreon or YouTube channel membership. Links to both are in the description box below. Thank you for watching.